This morning from John chapter 16, beginning in verse 12, with Jesus speaking, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. There was a bumper sticker that <clears throat> became popular when I was a teenager. It says, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. If you were old enough to be around in the 1970s, I bet in this part of the country you saw one of those bumper stickers. They became very popular. The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. It's short, it's pithy, it rings with confidence, but there is a problem. Actually, I would say there are many problems <clears throat> with that kind of bumper sticker theology, but I only have time to deal with one of them this morning. And this morning, what I want to focus on is that it contradicts what the Bible says. It contradicts what this very passage that we have from John, where Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Did you hear what he said in verse 12? I still have many things to say to you. I still have many things to say to you. Jesus has more to say. God has more to say then Jesus shared with the disciples, and Jesus is telling his disciples and telling us, there is more to come. There is more for you to learn. There are more ways in which you can grow as a disciple of Christ and a child of God. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now, Jesus says. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Now remember, Jesus has been saying, as we've been reading through this gospel of John, I do not speak on my own, I speak what the Father says to me. And now Jesus is saying there's more that God wants to say. And this spirit of truth, what we would call the Holy Spirit, is going to be available to you. And the Holy Spirit will be doing what I do, which is speaking words from God for you to guide and direct you into all truth. Christians claim that our religion is a revealed religion. That is, we do not reason to all these conclusions on our own. There are things God offers to us via the revelation of Christ as recorded in Scripture that we do not deduce on our own. It is revealed to us. It is truth and grace offered to us. Theologians sometimes call this ongoing revelation progressive revelation. That is, that God continues to help us progress and reveal to the world things that apply now, that we need to know now, in ways that we can apply our faith to our lives. Jesus says this is going to continue to happen because the Spirit of truth, this Holy Spirit, God and I are going to be sending to you. Jesus is that I'm going away, but you will not be abandoned because this Holy Spirit will be with you now and forever and will be speaking to you through the church for your good. I think it's not so hard to understand if we think of our own process of learning to read. We did not, any of us, begin with 300-page treaties on some scientific principle. 
We did not begin with 300-page novels when we began to read, did we? Can you remember the first sentence you read? It was probably something like, See, spot, run. <laughs> One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Right? We didn't begin with really complex sentences and really long, complicated ideas. We began with very simple ideas. Reading, nonetheless... But then we progressed over time. If we continue to study and focus and pay attention and practice, then we were able to read more and comprehend more and understand more. We made progress as we went along. And what Jesus is saying to his disciples today is God is going to be working with you in your faith so that you can progress there will be more to come. I'm sending you this spirit that will help you throughout your lives because there's more than you need to know. As United Methodists, we claim that the Bible contains everything necessary for faith and practice. We do not claim the Bible contains all truth. We do not claim that God finished speaking when the last book was written i want to read to you a couple of quotes from our historical doctrinal statements these are from the early days of our life together we believe the holy bible old and new testaments reveals the word of god so far as it is necessary for our salvation it is to be received through the Holy Spirit as the true rule and guide for faith and practice. What we claim as United Methodists is that our scriptures, our Bible, that these are books about faith. We not claim that they contain all truth. We not claim that they are books about science or even primarily about history. These are books that we believe God has inspired as people have had relationships with God and have captured those experiences for others to read and understand and comprehend and receive the experience of knowing God for themselves. We make a mistake to suggest that whenever Jesus died or several hundred years after that, whenever the church decided that these are the books of the Bible and none other. We make a mistake, though, if we think that God quit speaking, that God was no longer alive and at work in the world. We do not want to limit God's revelation solely to the Bible. See if you can hear that in another one of our statements. This comes from our United Methodist Theological Guidelines. United Methodist share with other Christians the conviction that Scripture is the primary source and criterion for Christian doctrine. The biblical authors, illumined by the Holy Spirit, bear witness that in Christ the world is reconciled to God. The Bible bears authentic testimony to God's self-disclosure in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as well as in God's work of creation, in the pilgrimage of Israel, and notice particularly this, and in the Holy Spirit's ongoing activity in human history. We believe God is still leading us. We believe God is still prompting us luring us into the future that God's love and grace is still active in the world and available for you in your life that's what Jesus is saying to these disciples I know that you're sad that I'm going away but it's going to be all right because the father and I are sending another the very spirit of truth my very spirit to be with you the Holy Spirit it's available to you now in your life, in your predicament, in your circumstances. 
The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is going to carry on the work that he was already doing. So we do not look for it to be radically different than what Jesus did during his life and ministry. For Jesus says his purpose in coming is to extend his work with you so that God might continue to work in us and among us and through us on behalf of the world. Hear these words again as John records them in verse 13 and 14. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own, but will speak whatever He hears, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, because He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. Do you hear the continuity? Do you hear the flow that Jesus reveals to his disciples in the way that God was working in him but will continue to work in the world for you? He's talking about his ministry that they have been a part of and that he wants them to continue. And it's a ministry of love and grace. It's interesting to me that as you read this Gospel of John, particularly these chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and next week we'll be in 17, how Jesus wraps up his ministry on this last night. He's with these disciples, and he starts talking about the centrality of this love. And next Sunday we'll see that he ends the conversation with a stirring prayer about the power of this love between people and God and with one another. Jesus' ministry has been about revealing the love of God to any and all that might receive it. And now he's saying that's what God wants to continue. And therefore God will send you this spirit of truth, this Holy Spirit to empower you so that you might be part of this ministry of love. Certainly, John Wesley had that experience in his own life. And even though he was educated and a professor at Oxford, he always tried to take the complex and the complicated parts of theology and the history of the church and the practices of the faith and make them practical. In much of his writings, he he was working to make what he was teaching, something that people could apply in their everyday lives. He wanted them to be able to use their faith as a resource for their everyday living. So often, when Wesley wrote about the activity of God or the Holy Spirit, it was often in the language of growing in God's grace. He's talking about the power of God and love and grace of God, but he often emphasized how that impacts us or these movements of grace that he wrote about. He identified three particular movements. The first one, he said, was God's love that is available to us before we even recognize it, before we ever have done anything to deserve it, that God's love is available and active in your life. Remington may not know that except for in the love of his parents, but Wesley said God's love is already there. God's love is already surrounding him. Wesley called it provenient grace, the grace that comes before we respond. But then Wesley said there's also that moment, that experience in our lives where we recognize that God's love is available to us and that God's grace is being offered to us, and we respond. And in that moment, he called that work justifying grace, or the moment of justification. Sometimes we would call that the salvation moment when we recognize that God's love is available to us through Christ and we respond. Every Sunday when I'm standing here just before the offering and extending an invitation for people to respond and say they want to be a follower or disciple of Jesus Christ, it's because I'm counting on God's justifying grace It's because I believe God is at work in your lives, leading you and prompting you. And so at some moment, you're ready to respond to that. Wesley called that justifying grace at work in your life. 
And then Wesley said, and this is a part he emphasized, it was brilliant, and not so many others write about this, but Wesley was very clear about this. He talked about God's sanctifying grace. He says, really, recognizing God's love alive in your life is just the beginning. The really great part is still to come. It's life with God. And that God's love and grace will continue to be active in your life and lead you into ever more abundant life and shape and form you ever more into the image of Christ. Sometimes he called it sanctification. Sometimes he called it holiness. Some people talk about holy habits. But it's the idea that God is at work in us from the very first moment that we respond to God's grace to develop a character and a spirit within us so that finally everything we do and everything we say is only motivated by the love of God and love of neighbor. How are you doing with that? Are you motivated solely by the love of God and the love of neighbor? Or do you find yourselves at time scheming, strategizing out of fear or frustration or anger of how to get your way or how to get back at somebody else or how to put someone in their place or how to wrest control of a situation at home or at work? I think most of us find ourselves in those experiences fairly often. But the Bible says, and Wesley articulated it so clearly, that God wants to bring us to a place where we're so full of God's spirit and love and grace that all we do is motivated by the love of God and the love of neighbor. That we can come to a place, and Wesley said we should even expect it because the Bible promises it, that we should expect to come to a place in our lives where all we want to do is the will of God. All we want to share is the love of God. No matter what we're doing or saying, it is because we've come to know the love of God and we want to embody that or share that with somebody else. John calls it abundant life. It's life with God as a follower of Jesus Christ. But I want us to notice that all of these movements of grace are describing The work of the Holy Spirit. It comes to us as grace, but it comes from God as the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit at work and alive in your life. I think we could call it progressive revelation in our own personal lives as we grow in faith and grow in grace. We see and understand and comprehend more of God and what God was doing in Christ and what God wants to do in our lives and what God wants to do in the world. And we make decisions ever more to cooperate with that love. It is indeed the work of a spirit that is alive. And Jesus wants his disciples to hear this, to look for it, to listen for it, to expect it to happen in their lives do you know the name john newton he wrote the most popular of american hymns at least in christianity amazing grace his story is a great story of conversion he was raised some as a christian but by the time he was a young adult he was working on slave ships he became the captain of a slave ship picking up people in africa turning them into slaves and then bringing them back to England or to the New World. But Wesley came under the influence, I mean, Newton came under the influence of the Wesleys and George Whitfield and some others. And he had this conversion experience. And he became a great Christian witness in his own time. But he wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace, I'm going to read to you the first three verses. Now, I know many of you have them memorized. But I want you to listen to see if you do not hear Newton describing these three movements of grace that Wesley writes about and that I'm suggesting to you are the work of the Holy Spirit. 
This is what he wrote, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Do you hear how he realized God was at work in his life before he knew it? And then the second verse, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed." He's describing justifying grace, his recognition that God's love is at work in his heart and his life. And then finally, the third verse, "'Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come.'" His grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Do you hear how he recognizes that God is with him and leading him, and God's love and grace, unmerited favors being offered to him, not only in that one moment, but for the rest of his life, and in fact will lead him through his life and to his eternal home. May it be true for each and every one of us. Amen.